I'm Roland Barris live. In, I'm Roland Barris live in Seattle, where right now the Broncos are taking on the Huskies in the season opener, and we're going to have a live report. And I'm Nicole Pineda, live in studio. I'm just back from Weezer, where the Weezer Complex fire is sending vacationers running out and firefighters moving in. And the crisis in Syria intensifies as President Obama says he plans to ask Congress for approval to take military action. Hello, everyone. I'm Jay Bates. Fox 9 on your side starts now. Fox 9 on your side at 9 starts now. The battle in Seattle is underway. Thanks for joining us tonight. We have a team on the ground at tonight's Boise State versus the University of Washington game. Let's go live to Husky Stadium in Seattle and join Roland Barrett. <laughs> Well, Jay, I got to tell you, it has been a festive atmosphere all day long. And right now, you can probably hear behind me, the crowd noise is deafening even outside the stadium. Add to that, we have the helicopters flying above. It gives you an idea of just how crazy it is here tonight for this big ball game. Right now, the Broncos are down 10 0 in the first half. And Bishop Sankey for the Huskies has been running rough shot. It's been primarily a defensive battle, but uh, it's going to have to be a second half game for the Broncos offensively. They just can't seem to get rolling. Don't know if it has to do with all the noise. We want to show you some video of Bronco fans and Husky fans arriving at a most unique way to the ball game tonight, coming by way of water through Lake Washington. And earlier in the day, we had a number of boats floating in, getting in early, the, the early birds. But I'll tell you what, once they really got rolling, it was a madhouse down there on the docks. It's kind of amazing how many people they can get into the stadium. Now, of course, this whole parking lot was absolutely jam-packed with fans just about an hour and a half ago. It's pretty much a ghost town out here now. Absolutely not a seat that is not taken inside the stadium tonight. Again, it has been a tough defensive battle early on. Uh, the Huskies managed to score the first touchdown uh, early in the first quarter. And now with about, I think, six minutes left in the half, uh, they were just able to get uh, an extra field goal, though they've been threatening pretty much all half long. Again, the Broncos have got to get their offense moving. We'll see if they can do that in the second half, but it appears like it's going to be a low-scoring affair. Jay? All right, thank you very much, Roland. Now, in tonight's game, Boise State unveiled a new ad that they hope will bring more people to Boise State. And so we were trying to figure out how do you get, how do you let folks know, let other students know what the lifestyle is like here and what, what Boise State life is like. So we wanted it just to kind of catch people, draw them in with the excitement and the fun. We knew we had a good story to tell and we just wanted to let them tell it. All right, this is a look at that new ad which debuted during the game tonight. BSU leaders didn't want the commercial to look typical and boring, so they reached out to the students for help. Tons of students sent in their own videos. School leaders hope it gives future applicants a good glimpse of what life is like at Boise State. University leaders say ESPN could televise up to 13 Bronco games this season, and they hope that the mix of Bronco success and the new national ad will help Boise State appeal to future students. Karen Lair has more on how football is bolstering the student body. It's no secret the Broncos are stirring up some nationwide buzz about BSU, but the athletic success of the school is helping to draw new applicants to the university, and not just from the Treasure Valley, but from all over the world. I'm coming from Southern California. Um, I moved it from Teton Valley from Victor. It's on the Wyoming border. From Long Beach, California, so like L.A. County. 3,500 new students from around the globe now call Boise State home. University leaders say the success of Boise State football has put them in the national spotlight. Students started having interest in Boise State that never did before. We hear of, you know, eight, nine, ten-year-olds who Boise State is just their favorite team and they live in Tennessee. And then it, the football team makes them look our way and then the, the university kind of is what they end up seeing. Boise State students come from all 50 states and at least 60 countries around the world. Of course, it was the academic opportunities that helped incoming students decide on BSU, but being able to step on the Broncos' famous blue field tops just about anything for many new freshmen. It was one of my <clears throat> college goals on my kind of college bucket list to come out on the blue field, so that's nice. But I've only seen it on TV, and I've never seen it for real. This is just like 
a dream. <laughs> it's amazing. Like you, it's like you don't really have any words. Like you see it on TV and you're like, oh yeah, they have the blue turf, and I'm standing on this turf right now. And it's just, it's a, it's amazing. It's like astonishing. You can't even put it all together, really. Good. University leaders continue to see an increase each year in the number of out-of-state applicants and hope the new ad will help draw even more students to all the things Boise has to offer. In studio, I'm Karen Lair, Fox 9 on your side. About 20% of BSU's 20,000 students came from outside the state of Idaho, and they expect this year's numbers to be even higher. Now we are tracking a pair of wildfires building into major headaches for firefighters. Nicole Pineda has just returned from base camp of the Weezer Complex Fire. Two fires continue to burn uncontained tonight in the Weezer area. Both the Hell's Canyon and Raft fires, now called the Weezer Complex Fire, have burned more than 9,500 acres each. And with more weather expected later this week, firefighters hope the storms bring rain and no more lightning. The fire started Thursday morning, the result of lightning strikes. Crews have been working to contain them, but Forest Service experts say they have a ways to go before they see any containment on the raft fire. Crews have been able to make it all the way around the Hell's Canyon fire. But it's Labor Day weekend and also the start of hunting season. These fires have sent a lot of vacationers back home, and many paid in advance for their campgrounds. And not only are we trying to encourage people to uh, uh, keep out of the area, uh, we're also working with them to, to see what we can do to make refunds happen and make sure that they're uh, taken care of. Both of these fires have damaged grasslands. Area ranchers have been notified of the fires and advised to remove their cattle from areas that are threatened. Many are concerned about what their animals will feed on this winter since many of those grasslands have been destroyed. Well, of course, the fire is burning very hot right now and forage values are being impacted. Our focus right now is to minimize the size of the fire, which will minimize the impacts to winter forage. Today, crews arrived to set up a camp at the base of the hills. The crews work quickly to get everything up and running as smooth as possible, as quickly as possible. Our goal is to get camp completely operational within 24 hours. Despite the fact that the catering service just arrived at noon today, they will be serving dinner to 400 hungry people tonight. More resources, including people, were ordered yesterday to help with the battle. Right now, several campgrounds are closed, including Spring Creek, Just Right, Paradise, and Kiwanis. And folks are being turned around at the forest boundary on the road. Two public meetings will be held on Monday. One will take place at 4 o'clock in Cambridge at the Exhibit Center at the fairgrounds. The other will take place at 6.30 in Weezer at the high school auditorium. And as always, we will keep you up to date on the progress of these fires. Live in studio, Nicole Pineda, Fox 9, on your side. Now, fire crews are optimistic they'll get the massive Beaver Creek fire near Haley finally under control today. Flame scorched almost 111,000 acres and has been burning for over three weeks. Officials say the fire is no longer a threat to the communities of Haley and Ketchum. Crews spent most of the today mopping up and looking for hot spots. A few trails in the area have now been reopened. If you are heading into the Boise National Forest this holiday weekend, we do have some good news. Most areas are open now that the wildfires are starting to wind down, at least in that area. Some roads, like the popular South Fork Boise Road, are now open, but hazards still remain. And the road itself, the South Fork Boise River Road, is open, but the actual area around the river and the river itself is still currently closed, again, because of the concern with snag trees. There's a lot of cottonwood trees that have been burned through and that have the potential of falling and, in fact, have fallen unexpectedly and rock rolling down into, the, uh, into that area. The Middle Fork Boise River Road near Atlanta is also open today, but the Little Queens fire is still burning in that area. Officials tell us it's only about 20% contained. And remember, stage one fire restrictions are still in effect. That means that campfires are only allowed in Forest Service developed structures. If you've been thinking about adopting a new pet, this is the perfect time. The Idaho Humane Society is holding back to school adoption specials on all cats and dogs. You can take home a cat or a kitten for only $5, and all dogs and puppies are half off. This still includes your new pet's spay or neuter, first set of vaccines, and a microchipping fee. Tons of people showed up at the shelter today to take home one of their newest family members. I moved out of my house, so I left my dog there. She was older and kind of like the family's dog. So it'll be nice to just kind of have my own 
first dog, basically. Um, one is a kitten named Brody, and he's gray and white. One's name is Lexi, and she's white and black. My mom wanted Brody, and I wanted Lexi, because she was really nice. The adoption specials will continue until Friday, September the 6th. Now, the On Your Side forecast with Steve Liebenthal. And we are done with August after today, but it's not feeling much like September just yet. Our temperature is well above average once again today, and the temperature right now at the Boise Airport is 89 degrees. That is actually warmer than the average high temperature for today, and we made it up to 95 this afternoon. The average for the state is 87 degrees, so well above average once again. Those readings in the mountains as well being in the mid 80s to upper 80s, also much warmer than is normal for this time of year. And Overall, the month of August was about three degrees warmer than average. High pressure controlling our weather. You see very little cloud cover over the northwest right now, and that includes Seattle, and it's a pretty nice evening there for folks watching the game with sunny skies and a temperature right now of 73 degrees. And we don't have any major changes coming in our weather, Jay, although there is a storm system off the coast, and we are expecting some cloud cover to move in starting on Monday afternoon. So we have a chance of showers in the forecast, and I'll tell you when the odds are high for those in just a few minutes. All right, thanks, Steve. You bet. President Barack Obama says he wants the U.S. to take military action against Syria, but will seek congressional authorization for the use of force. On Saturday, the president said he has the authority to act on his own, but believes it is important for the country to have a debate. Fox's Leland Vittert is following this developing story from Jerusalem. Responding to what he calls the worst chemical weapons attack of the 21st century, President Obama from the White House Rose Garden says the U.S. is prepared to attack Bashar Assad's regime. In a world with many dangers, this menace must be confronted. After careful deliberation, I have decided that the United States should take military action against Syrian regime targets. In Wayne, a military response to the August 21st attack when some 1,400 Syrians were killed, the president says he will ask Congress to approve a strike. I will seek authorization for the use of force from the American people's representatives in Congress. In front of the White House, vocal protests for and against U.S. intervention in the Syrian civil war. The United Nations says chemical weapons experts have left Syria after four days of inspections into the attack. President Obama warned last August that any use of chemical weapons would cross a red line in Syria. On Friday, Secretary of State John Kerry backed up the president's threat. It matters to who we are, and it matters to leadership and to our credibility in the world. With his intention to seek approval from Congress, President Obama has made it clear the U.S. military is ready to go and his order could come at any time. It will be effective tomorrow or next week or one month from now. Congress right now is on recess. They haven't been called back to Washington for an extraordinary session in some 60 years. President Obama says he's not going to do that. Instead, waiting till they return on September 9th for a debate and vote. In Jerusalem, Leland Vittert, Fox News. Syrians continue to flee their war-torn country as the civil war rages on. Dozens of vehicles packed with luggage and mattresses crossing into Lebanon from Syria after U.N. investigators looking into last week's chemical weapons attack left near Damascus. Some two million people fled Syria since the start of the conflict in March of 2011, and more than 100,000 are dead. More than 100,000 all died in, during that time. World reaction to President Obama's statements on Syria are rolling in, and they are mixed. Fox's Brian Yanis continues our team report with a look at what people are saying. As President Obama spoke in the White House Rose Garden, hundreds of activists demonstrating against military action inside Syria marched outside the White House. Syria is not at war with the United States. Sharing the same plaza, dozens of counter-protesters advocated for U.S. action to stop the regime of Bashar al-Assad. If Obama doesn't do anything about it, it's just going to give him a green light to keep killing. Demonstrations spanning across the country. Hands off Syria! Chicagoans marching in dissent largely against military operations. They want the money that could be spent on that war and the money spent on past wars to, spend, to be spent on things they need. On Saturday, demonstrators in Los Angeles and protesters in St. Louis, Shreveport, Charlotte, Tulsa, and Indianapolis all objecting. 
Do you want a sequel to Iraq and Afghanistan? Reactions are mixed overseas. The one European nation that expressed willingness to join in a U.S.-led campaign in Syria is France, the former colonial power in Syria. It would have been better if the United Nations had found a solution. There is a feeling of fear, of anxiety, that this will be a real declaration of war. More than 200,000 Syrian refugees have fled to Turkey for their safety, some reacting to President Obama's decision. If the strike is going to get rid of Bashar and his regime, and finish the massacres, then yes. With Navy ships on standby in the Mediterranean Sea ready to launch their cruise missiles, President Obama is expected to wait until September 9th for Congress to return from their August recess. In New York, Brian Yenis, Fox News. Keep it on Fox 9 for the latest developments on the Syria in crisis. Later on on Fox 9 on your side, thousands of people gather to celebrate the birthday of Harley Davidson. And next, a parent's nightmare as two young kids go for a joyride with tragic consequences. Hear the dramatic 911 calls next. You're watching Fox 9 on your side at 9. Two children attempt to take a joyride that ends in disaster. That's what's happening right now in America. Fox News correspondent Will Carr brings us the dramatic 911 call. Authorities say this was a tragic joyride that may not have been preventable. They say that on Wednesday, an eight-year-old and a six-year-old sister jumped into their mom's car, started driving around the streets of Phoenix, and immediately caught the attention of other drivers on the road. I was shocked. I mean, I didn't, I didn't even believe it at first, but, you know, I had to because I knew that there were kids. Rudy De La Cruz immediately called 911. As for the kid's mom, she says she put the kids to bed, went to bed herself, and then woke up and realized her kids and her car were missing and immediately called 911. Uh, my car has been stolen and my kids have been taken. My door was unlocked okay. and my door was locked when I went to sleep. My spare key has gone out of my purse. My purse was in my room with me. Police caught up to the car with the 8-year-old behind the wheel, but before they could get him to pull over, the car crashed, hitting a light pole, the six-year-old girl died. She was not wearing a seatbelt. The eight-year-old boy had minor injuries. At this point, authorities are saying it does not look like the kid's mom will face any charges. They're simply saying it looks like this was a tragic accident. In Los Angeles, Will Carr, Fox News. A Florida man is found guilty of manslaughter after his dogs killed a seven-year-old boy. Edward Daniels could face 15 years in prison when he's sentenced in October. His dogs attacked and killed seven-year-old Tyler Jett in April. They will get their son back. We will never have Tyler. We will never be able to hold him and kiss him and love him and see him after school or anything like that. They'll have the chance to ride him and talk to him on the phone. It's sort of kind of closure. I mean, it'll never bring him back, but it's justice for Tyler. The dogs were believed to be at least part bulldog. They were euthanized after the attack. A university of Maryland has suspended its entire cheerleading team. Towson University suspended its national championship winning cheerleading team for this upcoming, ac upcoming academic year after members violated their school's hazing policy. The team will not be able to practice or perform at any competitions or university sporting events. Well, I think everybody hazes around here, and I think they just don't catch them. They get the crowd hype, so we need our cheerleading squad. I think it's terrible that we suspend them for the whole year. Towson is a public university near Baltimore. The cheerleaders plan to appeal their suspension, but will remain inactive during the appeals process. San Diego Mayor Bob Filner is officially out of office after nearly 20 women accused him of sexual harassment. City Council President Todd Gloria is now the interim mayor and says he has a lot of work ahead of him. A special election will be held in November on the 19th with an expected cost of some $6 million. A familiar voice may be headed to American Idol. The Hollywood Reporter magazine says singer and actor Harry Connick Jr. is signing up to serve as a judge with Keith Urban and Jennifer Lopez. Music producer Dr. Luke, who was considered a frontrunner last week, reportedly dropped out of consideration. Precautions must be taken within the United States any time the nation takes military action. And those in charge of guarding the homeland are preparing for what the future could hold. Fox's Catherine Herridge has the details. A joint bulletin from the Homeland Security Department and the FBI was sent out earlier this week to alert federal, state and local law enforcement about the possible blowback from a limited military strike in Syria. 
An administration official said Homeland Security, quote, is closely following the situation and actively collaborates and shares information in the face of constantly evolving threats. If there is a response from Syrian President Assad, his ally Iran or Hezbollah, the Shiite militia backed by Tehran, analysts predict it will be an asymmetric response, a cyber or terror attack which does not involve directly confronting the U.S. So you can imagine possible threats against airliners, possible threats against um, anything from what Hezbollah did in Bulgaria where they targeted um, Jewish tourists. That's a reference to this suicide attack last summer which killed six and injured 32. Military analysts also point to this week's denial of service attack on the New York Times website by a group sympathetic to the Syrian regime as a likely probing incident designed to test the system. What you've also seen here that's new, an increase in actual cyber attacks. You've already had the Friends of Assad organization, with servers apparently housed out of Russia, um, launch cyber attacks against um, multiple news organizations. With the conflict escalating and increasingly seen as part of the global jihad for Islamists, the FBI director explained in a recent interview the Bureau's focus on Westerners, specifically American passport holders, who are joining the fight and could launch terrorist attacks on U.S. soil. One of the concerns I think we all have at this juncture of persons traveling to Syria, gaining expertise and uh, bringing it uh, back friends to this country. And bringing it back to this country or bringing it back to Europe. Mm -hmm. Have you seen documented cases of American citizens traveling from this country to Syria and then coming back? Yes, and we've had uh, uh, at least one indictment. I have it directly in my mind, but uh, others that we, if we have not yet indicted, uh, may face charges down the road. Federal law enforcement officials are pushing back against a report that the Bureau is already interviewing Syrians living in the U.S., but not denying proactive steps are being taken in the event the U.S. is drawn by choice into the Syrian conflict. In Washington, Catherine Herridge, Fox News. Coming up next on Fox 9, On Your Side, we're going to head over to the Weather Center for Steve Liebenthal's On Your Side forecasts. And an American icon celebrating 110 years. Happy birthday to Harley Davidson coming up. Now the On Your Side forecast with Steve Liebenthal. It came down first. It was just kind of mud being pushed by water and there's more mud but then it just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger until you see what we have now wild weather continues to plague the inland empire region of california heavy rains caused flash flooding and mudslides forcing residents to evacuate and tow truck drivers have also been responding to many accidents the weather is expected to improve tomorrow and yeah <laughs> oh wow it probably can't get much worse than that. And yeah, there have been quite a few thunderstorms in Southern California as well as Southern Nevada. Uh, as monsoonal moisture comes in, you get the heating of the day. That creates a very unstable atmosphere. You get that lift in the atmosphere, and that causes those showers and thunderstorms to occur. And as you saw, some heavy rain and also some strong winds flowing out of those storm systems. So uh, volatile weather to the south of us. That's generally where our weather is coming from. And eventually some of that moisture is going to work its way into southern Idaho along with the hot air that's coming as well. In fact, we're expecting temperatures tomorrow to be even hotter than they were today, shooting for a high of 96 in Boise. Today we made it up to 95, and the actual average or normal for today's date is 85 degrees. So we were 10 full degrees warmer than average in Boise and generally around southern Idaho today. And we do have a storm system out over the Pacific Ocean right here. It is cut off from the jet stream, so it's moving very slowly, but we continue that or expect that slow movement to continue in our direction and as that area of low pressure comes in our direction and is met by that moisture coming up from the south we're expecting to get some very thick cloud cover starting Monday afternoon in fact the clouds will be so thick that we might not even get much sunshine through which would actually be a very good thing because it's the Sun that heating of the surface that I talked about in Southern California that creates thunderstorms when you get that heating you get a great amount of lift in the atmosphere and it's that strong lift that creates thunderstorms so if we get enough cloud cover that the sun is blocked out and we don't get that extreme heating of the surface we could get some rain that would come without lightning and that would be a very good thing for Idaho fires right now not guaranteeing that there won't be any lightning but the likelihood of thunderstorms is a little bit lower with this storm system than it was with the last one which came in by the way that one did help 
overall on the fire lines, but it did also start some new fires. Morning lows a little bit warmer than they have been. 59 was or rather a little bit cooler. 59 was the low in Boise this morning. 53 in Mountain Home. Great time to open those windows up and let some cool air in the morning, but we did make it up to 95 degrees this afternoon, and we're expecting morning lows to be right around 70 degrees for the next couple of days once we get that cloud cover. If we have a low of 70 degrees on Monday morning, that would actually tie the record for the warmest morning low ever for that day. But in the meantime, that hot air coming out of the desert southwest. So yeah, another hot day tomorrow. Eventually the moisture comes in and meets that area of low pressure and that's when we expect the clouds to thicken up and that brings the possibility of some rain our way. The temperature right now at the Boise Airport is 83 degrees, so almost as warm as what we would normally expect for the afternoon high. And as you can see from this map, the jet stream will stay well to the north of us for the next 24 hours and that's why temperatures will once again be anywhere from 5 to 10, in our case 11 degrees warmer than average. And again, slow moving area of low pressure, but it will continue to creep in our direction and you can expect to start seeing some cloud cover coming out of that by Sunday afternoon and eventually the jet stream will come very close to us. That will pick our winds up, but it will also cool our temperatures by the latter part of next week. Tomorrow afternoon high of 96 degrees, lots of sunshine, 95 in Meridian. We'll continue to see that heat for uh, well, off and on into the work week, but temperatures will generally drop, especially toward the end of the week. Warm day in the northern part of the west central mountains, a hot day in the southern part of the west central mountains, just a few clouds popping up in the afternoon. In the east central mountains, mostly sunny and warm, 83 for Sun Valley is warm, 82, very warm for this time of year. Notice the low in Stanley, though, gets down to 34 degrees. Down in the Magic Valley, mostly sunny, light winds, afternoon highs still well above average for this time of year in the lower 90s. Here is my extended on your side forecast and again look for those clouds to increase during the day on Monday that leads to a chance of showers Monday afternoon and evening overnight into Tuesday not much chance of any thunderstorms on Monday but Tuesday and Wednesday we could see some thunderstorms and it's not until Friday that we finally see an afternoon high that is in the 80s which is where we're supposed to be this time of year but if there is a silver lining in all of that there is the the rain Monday could help with some of these fires. Yeah, for those, and the last rainstorm we got helped overall mm -hmm. but the lightning did start a, a couple of new fires that we're dealing with now all right thanks Steve appreciate yeah. it the sights and sounds of Harley Davidson's 110th anniversary celebration fill the streets of Milwaukee this weekend. From Mexico to Poland and Malaysia to Australia, Harley enthusiasts travel thousands of miles to participate in this weekend's fun. Fox's Mike Lowe takes a look. You can't have revelry without some revving. At least not during Harley's 110th anniversary celebration. We was here for the 100, the 105th. We decided to come back for the 110th. Surrounding businesses did everything they could to bring in bikers. We've been standing on the street all day, shaking it. And that included bringing out bikinis. Oh, so Kelly Johnson and Allie Pinter were enticing customers with a chance to see them splash in the dunk tank near the East Cider Bar. We're trying really hard here. But perhaps the biggest draw was the parking, free and blocked off for bikers who enjoyed beer and live music on North Avenue. This is the main thing tonight, I believe. North Avenue, the great band from Australia, a local guy singing first, and Fox 6 is here. <laughs> can't beat that, right? No, you can't beat Fox 6. Yeah, we can with Fox 9. Detroit was one of America's great stories, but now city leaders are tearing it down one house at a time. Find out why coming up. And next, why are these people having their pooches poked? You'll find out. Is your dog a little under the weather or having some problems moving around? Well, maybe you should give it the needle. No, not that one. As Fox's Ashley Mastronardi tells us, your pup can get acupuncture. Acupuncture, the centuries-old method of well-being, has gone to the dogs. He had knee injuries and a hip injury. Sue Strange's former border collie, Dudley, received acupuncture treatments toward the end of his life at Park Animal Hospital, a family practice in Darien and Norwalk, Connecticut. She says the results were obvious. He was happy to run around and, and play frisbee again. Uh, he was just more engaged. Today, her 12-year-old dog, Nell, is receiving acupuncture for the first time. Dr. Scopit, a holistic vet, is performing the treatment. 
the more needles that you're inserting, um, you're basically inserting them in areas of the body that have a concentrated number of blood vessel endings. You're actually stimulating um, production of hormones in the body, and those hormones are like our natural pain relievers. Beamer's in the middle of his acupuncture treatment, and he seems to be tolerating it pretty well. Dr. Scopit said the needle stay in anywhere from about 10 to 30 minutes, depending on what's being treated. But they don't speak, so uh, you know we have to we have to look at them and see you know what's hurting them. Um, you know, are they are they coming in in a hunched up position where maybe the back is hurting or maybe the belly is hurting? Scopit says doggy acupuncture, which has been around for decades, is also used to treat seizures and even cancer. She says there's no scientific evidence to back up that it works, but Strange says the calm that used to come over Dudley was undeniable. He'd be so relaxed that sometimes he wouldn't even want to take treats. He would just put his head down on the floor and, you know, almost fall asleep. You can get acupuncture for your dog at a holistic vet for about $90. We did some checking in. There are numerous veterinarians throughout Idaho who also perform acupuncture on animals. He is one of the biggest names in football, except now he's looking for a job. Here where Tim Tebow may land next. And coming up next, tearing down parts of a city to build a brighter future. Crime, poverty, and the urban decay of Detroit have left the city with tens of thousands of abandoned and run-down buildings. Taken over by drug dealers, the mentally ill, and the homeless, now the Motor City has started what is being called an all-hands-on-deck initiative to save the city. Fox News' Garrett Tenney gives us the lowdown on the project. Stay away and scrappers will be shot. Signs like these are a common sight in neighborhoods all across the Motor City, where there are more than 78,000 abandoned homes. Most of them fall out from the housing crisis. More than 30 of those homes are on Robert Couch's small street and have become magnets for squatters, scrappers, and criminals. We bring our neighborhood down, our community down. It ain't no community. We try to do what we can as neighbors, but, you know, neighbors can't do it all by themselves. But now help is on the way in the form of wrecking balls and dump trucks. In a first-of-its-kind program, Michigan is taking on Detroit's foreclosure crisis and attempting to stabilize its neighborhoods by demolishing more than 4,000 abandoned homes across the city, calling it the largest blight removal effort in state history. By eliminating the blight in a neighborhood, we increase the property values, give the folks an incentive to stay in their homes, and that therefore maybe they won't get into a foreclosure problem. Robert Couch says he's already seeing a difference. You can look around and see the neighborhood is a lot better than what it was in the past. So it's, a, it's, 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 it's doing a little bit better. State officials say they will need about $600 million to demolish the 78,000 blighted homes across the city. The current project has funding for about 4,000 of those homes, but they say if it goes well, they will be able to get additional funding. In Detroit, I'm Garrett Tenney, Fox News. Good head on Fox 9 on your side. He was once one of the biggest stories in football. Tonight, the question is, is Tim Tebow a bust? Tim Tebow has confirmed that he has been cut by the New England Patriots. Tebow posted on his Twitter account that he was thankful the team gave him an opportunity to play in the preseason. Now, as Joe Carter reports, the question is, what's ahead for the quarterback? Since I was six years old, uh, it's been a dream to be a quarterback in the NFL. That dream became reality for Tim Tebow when he was drafted by the Denver Broncos in 2010. After the team got off to a poor start the following season, Tebow was named the starter. And with his knack for fourth quarter comeback victories, Tebow mania reached new heights. He is bigger than American Idol and the X Factor. Now they're calling him the Mile High Messiah. You are one of the biggest sensations this past year. It goes well beyond football. Tebow's crowning achievement was an overtime win against the Pittsburgh Steelers in the playoffs. But his time in Denver ended abruptly when the Broncos signed Peyton Manning and traded Tebow to the New York Jets. Why the Jets wanted Tebow was puzzling. His skills as a quarterback were openly questioned, and he was already a polarizing figure due to his public displays of faith. At the very least, the media's fascination with all things Tebow kept people talking about the Jets. I've never seen anything like it for a guy that, frankly, just hadn't won that much or done that much. I mean, you saw this with guys like Michael Jordan, um, Tiger Woods. Tebow was almost in that pantheon, almost in that same sentence in terms of popularity. 
and he had accomplished very little, so it was a very, very odd thing to watch. The Jets' season ended in disaster, with Tebow barely touching the field. To no one's surprise, he was unceremoniously released from the team in April. Tebow was picked up by the Patriots, a stint that lasted just four <laughs> preseason games. And now, the future for one of the NFL's most recognizable names is uncertain. If he's going to stay in the NFL, he has to play another position. He can't play quarterback. He's, he's lost sort of the ability, what little ability he had to play quarterback. He's kind of lost it. So that's, if he wants to stay in professional football, that's what he's got to do. Joe Carter, CNN, Atlanta. The Broncos and Huskies are at the half. Our crew still working hard, though. Let's send it up to Seattle, where Paul Gerke and Mike Sharp will tell you what's on deck. Good evening, Jay. We're going to talk about the Broncos' first half performance against Washington. In case you're not watching the game and you're here with us, we appreciate your patronage. 10-3 Washington at the break. I'll let you know how we got there coming up in sports. Now sports with sports director Paul Gerke. The second half just about to begin here at Husky Stadium in Seattle. I'm sports director Paul Gerke alongside reporter Mike Sharp. We've been inside the stadium covering the game. In case you haven't been watching and you've been watching us instead, we appreciate it. Last score, 10-3 Huskies at the break. Mike, thoughts on the first half so far? Well, obviously, Boise State came out not playing the way that they probably would have liked. However, what you saw toward the end of the first half was a Boise State team that seemed to start coming together a little bit more and maybe closing on some of those tackles that they weren't early in the first half. When you talk about a tough start, it was interceptions on both sides. Keith Price threw a pick to Dante Dion, and then Joe Southwick returned the favor on a long ball attempt, just uh, getting those jitters out of the way early. But Keith Price really did figure things out quickly. 193 yards passing in the first half, torching that young secondary. Well, that was the really interesting part. Keith Price seems to be doing anything at well. Whereas Boise State has been able to do a little bit better than they did against Sankey. I feel like through most of the first and into the second quarter, Boise State's offense just couldn't find a rhythm. They're off the field too quickly. Keith Price and Bishop Sankey just controlling that offense, grinding first downs, grinding first downs. And I think Boise State is fortunate at this point to only be down a touchdown. Well, yeah, and I think uh, it's easy to jump on a team. Uh, but when you come out, you get a turnover. You immediately turn the ball over. That's deflating. And then you drive the field and you get a field goal blocked. It's something that's hard to come back from. That's a big momentum loss. And that's a great point. They talk about deflating. Talk about Dan Goodale, best remembered for his missed kick against TCU that could have secured an undefeated season, perhaps, for Boise State. Goes out there, and his first kick after being crowned the starting kicker gets blocked by the Husky defense. But he did manage to rebound late in the second quarter. Yeah, he looked a lot better. It's something we mentioned in our pregame show is the fact that it's a big mental game. And the fact that he came back, that shows promise in Coach Pete trusting him as well as his own trust of himself. I saw Goodale sitting on the sidelines on the exercise bike after having that kick blocked with his hands over his ear holes, just blocking out the Husky noise, getting his head straight, and then he comes in in his next attempt and drills a field goal, which Boise State, uh, unfortunately, their only points of the first half. Let's talk a little bit about that offense and the way it's clicked so far. I said to you when we were walking back, first half MVP, Geraldo Boldevine, looks like a reliable target for Southwick. That's a player that uh, everybody's been waiting to, to kind of blossom, and he's doing it, and that's a beautiful thing. Well, it helps that he's on the field. I mean, this is the first time in the last three years he hasn't been suspended for the first four games. Uh, looked like he was Joe's favorite target in the first half. If you hear the background noise, start to pick up the Broncos and Huskies retaking the field here at Husky Stadium. If you're just joining us, 10-3 Washington at last check. We're reporting live outside the stadium. We'll be giving you updates throughout the rest of the night. Um, one more person I wanted to touch on real quickly, defensive MVP Corey Bell looking great, the local product. It's nice to see. He's all over the field. He seems to be playing a hand in pretty much every tackle. It's pretty special. He's been one of those guys that's like a special team sort of guy, and this year he's got a chance to start at that nickel hybrid position, and I think his, uh, his determination and perseverance over the last few years at Boise State is really paying off at this point. Tell you what, you hear the game starting behind us. You have to think Boise State has to be happy coming in down, just down 10 to 3 after giving up 335. That's right. We'll have another update in uh, 10 o'clock in the A block. Stay with us on today's 6 and Fox 9 live in Seattle. Paul Gerke, Mike Sharp, Fox 9 on your side. All right, thank you very much, guys. We're sneaking a peek at the game in here as well. We'll have uh, much more. Coming up, but let's take a live look at Boise from the Ford Dealers Tower Cam. Meteorologist Steve Liebenthal will be back with a final look at your weather coming up. <music> Comic book lovers from across the Treasure Valley packed the Boise Public Library today for the first ever library Comic Con. 
Elaborate costumes lurked around every corner, and those who attended enjoyed a costume contest, panel discussions, and a chance to check out the artwork of some Treasure Valley comic book artists. People who showed up were surprised to see the amount of local artists hiding right here in Boise. There are some incredible um, professionals who have gathered here. I didn't know that we had so many that were local or that would want to come to Boise and share this with people. And really just watching kids that are so excited about coming to the library, reading, picking up a magazine, picking up a comic book, talking to other people. What could be better? Event organizers hope to make Comic Con an annual tradition. Kind of like in Atlanta, Georgia today, sci-fi and fantasy fans gathered for the annual Dragon Con Festival. Downtown Atlanta is taken over with fans walking around in colorful costumes of their favorite characters. Organizers expect to draw at least 55,000 people to the convention this year based on pre-ticket sales alone. Hmm. All right, what are you dressing up for? <laughs> is it for the rain on Monday? Uh, y yeah, you, you, you might want to take a, <laughs> might want to take some rain gear. I guess some of that stuff would deflect the rain. That would be one good excuse for wearing it. Let's see if I can think of another one. <laughs> nope. No, no, nothing comes to mind. Yeah, we have some showers possible starting on Monday afternoon. Tomorrow's going to be another hot day with an afternoon high of 96 degrees. It's going to look a lot like today. 66 is our forecast morning low. That low of 70 degrees for Monday morning would tie the warmest low temperature ever for that date. And that's because of some cloud cover we're expecting to move in. Those clouds will lead to a 30% chance of showers on Monday. Clouds thick enough that they might help us avoid thunderstorms. And we certainly hope that is the case. But we do have the slight possibility of thunderstorms for Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and even into Thursday. Our highest likelihood of seeing showers is going to be on Tuesday. A 40% chance here in the valley, about a 60% chance by Tuesday in the mountains. And we're staying in the 90s all the way through the week until Friday. 10-6 right now for Washington. We've got an update coming up over on Today 6.